that sometimes traditional antioxidants can help, often they do nothing, and occasionally they can make things worse. What happens when these same people, whether they were taking traditional antioxidants or not, took protandum for 30 days. And if you get rid of the before data and just look at the after, this is what's mean by the age-dependent increase has gone completely. That line is now flat from 20 to 80. And the 80-year-olds have no more evidence of oxidative stress than the 20, the 21, the 23-year-olds in this study. If you looked at the 80-year-old after a month, you could still tell that was the 80-year-old, okay? It did not reverse the aging process. It didn't reverse everything about it. But it did stop one of the biochemical markers associated with aging. Is that significant? I, I think it is. And I think all of you probably think it is. Chronologically, they were still 80 years old. Biochemically, they were in better shape. Protandum eliminated that age-dependent increase. Another important thing, the two antioxidant enzymes we were focused on initially showed distinct elevations, increases, significant increases. And that accounts for what happened with T-bars. It was because of the contribution of those enzymes that this oxidation uh, was held in check. A lot of people ask then, and they still ask, what's T-bars got to do with, with living a long, healthy life? They may say, I asked my doctor, to check my T-bars, and he'd never even heard of T-bars. And that's not unusual. T-bars is used in research labs, and doctors don't spend time in research labs. They spend time taking care of their patients. They don't know what goes on in research labs, and they don't know if T-bars is relevant or not. This is a paper that, uh, there, there are many papers, there are more than 8,000 papers that have measured T-bars, and they measure it for a reason. It tells those investigators something important. The title of this, Serum Levels of T-Bars, Thiobarbituric Acid Reactive Substances, predict cardiovascular events in patients with stable coronary artery disease. This is a large segment of the elderly population that would qualify for this, stable coronary artery disease. And their levels of T-Bars, exactly what we measured and what you saw decline, predicts cardiovascular events. Cardiovascular events are blood clots in arteries their angina attacks due to occluded arteries that are letting only 10% of the normal amount of blood through. They're not good things. They're things that can bring you to your knees. They're things that can cause you to drop dead. They're things that can cause recurrent chronic chest pain. T-bars was a better predictor of cardiovascular events than cholesterol levels. T-bars is a better indicator of what's going to happen to your heart than cholesterol is. This paper is probably the most important paper, 2008, important to me at least, because it delineated what we know about NERF2 activation, the, the data I just showed you. Protandum mediated heme oxygenase, HO1 induction, an important antioxidant enzyme, involved the presence of antioxidant response element site, nuclear translocation of the transcription factor NERF2. Remember when the green and the red made yellow? That's what enabled this statement to be made. Protandum caused NERF2 to move into the nucleus where it could activate those genes. It tells us precisely what the mechanism of action of this is. It's not hand-waving. It's not, if you take this, you'll probably feel better. You know, the person three doors down took it, and now they can run hurdles or do whatever. It's not anecdotal. It's not hearsay, it's hard documented science. This is the paper that showed the synergy. The synergy of protandum caught us all by surprise. It was far more than we hoped for. You might say, why'd you put five ingredients in protandum? Why not just pick the best one? Our bodies don't let those ingredients in. Our guts keep out most of those ingredients. So you can get low concentrations of each of the five but not high concentrations. No matter how much you take, you're limited to a low circulating amount. What this slide shows is if you look at the individual contributions of those five ingredients, control is nothing. Ashwagandha is the first ingredient, 
essentially nothing by itself. Bacopa, nothing. Green tea, that's actually negative a little bit by itself. Silymarin, okay, something there. And curcumin, also negative. You put those all together and you get the red bar on the right. That's what synergy is. A lot of people may look at the, they may look at the label. They may say, well, I've heard of several of these things and I've been taking curcumin for the last three years. Why do I need to take Protandum, which may be more expensive than my bottle of curcumin. This is the reason. You can't do it with curcumin alone. You can't do it with any two of those. All five of those contribute to this powerful synergy in this particular endpoint 18 times more than we expected to see by the sum of these individual low concentrations of the ingredients. Better than the sum of the parts. So that second paper showed that the five ingredients produce this huge synergy, that each ingredient acts at a low and pharmacologically attainable dose. Sometimes there are papers published showing that in a petri dish, curcumin can do this great thing. Well, your body is not a petri dish. For your body to use curcumin, you have to take the curcumin capsule and it would have to be absorbed and transported through your body. That's what's limited, it doesn't happen. A little bit of curcumin gets in, not much. Protandum works because the five ingredients, it's okay if they're at low concentrations. In fact, it's better that they're at low concentrations because some of them have toxic effects at high concentration. Five things at low concentration, working together, amplifying the NERF2 activation is what does the trick and specific ratios are important. So there's synergy, there's low dose effectiveness, and there's a specific ratio of these five ingredients. This paper also showed that glutathione is dramatically increased nearly fourfold by treating cells with protandum. And it's not because protandum contains the precursors you need to make glutathione, it doesn't. How's it working? It's causing the enzymes that make glutathione to be produced. That's the part that's rate limiting. The mechanisms are very different. This shows cysteine, one of the key amino acids in glutathione, gets into your cell. And the, the enzyme shown there in blue, glutathione synthase, is upregulated by protandum. So you can make GSH, glutathione, an important antioxidant protectant in your cells. But amazingly, what limits the amount of glutathione most cells can make is not the amount of cysteine that's circulating through your body. There's a little pro protein there called XC minus, and it's a turnstile protein. If your cell is like your local branch bank, it may have a revolving door to get into that bank. And this protein let cysteine get in one side of that revolving door, but only if another molecule, glutamate, is coming out the other side of that revolving door. So it's like a heavy door that it takes two people to push to get one in and one out. That's one of the most powerfully upregulated genes by protandum. And that's the part of this whole glutathione synthetic pathway that's limiting, that's the slow point. You may have cysteine lined up outside the bank waiting to get through, if you don't have a, a working door or enough doors in that bank, no matter how much cysteine is waiting outside, it's not going to happen. So making glutathione is not getting more cysteine into your body or acetylcysteine or any precursor. It's about upregulating those enzymes that can put it together and make it for you.